Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're talking about cybersecurity and digital payments. We'll look at some of the challenges to cybersecurity when it comes to moving money, and we'll also look at the future of cybersecurity and digital payments. To discuss that, I'm joined by Michael Jabara, Vice President, Global Head of Fraud and Services at Visa. Uh, Michael, very good to talk with you today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. So I, I'm amazed at the number of headlines that the cybersecurity gets these days. Sometimes I think the the, the, the bad guys are, are, are winning in the battle against the good guys. Uh, love to get your sense as you survey what's happening with cybersecurity and digital payments. What are, what are some trends that are, that are moving the market in the year 2022? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, well, I'll just start off by saying that, uh, you know, the, the bad guys get the headlines when they succeed, but the good guys never get the headline when we're thwarting them at every turn. So right, there's a right. bit of a selection bias there. Mm -hmm. But I would say the, uh, I think that the key trend is really around transformation. Uh, the fact that we have seen this rapid acceleration and the digitization of how people pay, how they shop, how they communicate, how they work. Uh, you know, trends that would had already existed prior to the pandemic kind of got a booster shot and now are, you know, five, 10 years down the line from uh, where they used to be. And of course, whenever you have this innovation, whenever you're transitioning from one stage to the other, there are these seams that fraudsters and cyber threat actors are looking to exploit for their own illicit gains. So I think that's why you're seeing so much attention in this uh, area right now. It's because we're going through this transitionary phase. There are these new models of operating, and uh, we're working very diligently to make sure that this kind of next phase of consumer payments is as secure as even even more secure than what has come before it. Hmm. So you made an interesting point about COVID and the way it changed uh, cybersecurity and, and digital payments, and there was a big shift. Do you feel that shift is, is a temporary move or, or is it really, everything has really changed now? No, I think it's very much has changed. I don't think it was a temporary move. And I think so for a couple of reasons. First is that we were already seeing these shifts occur prior to the pandemic. They were just happening on a slower timeline, right? We, we always knew that people were going to be uh, spending their money in a more virtual way, that there's going to be these new and innovative payment use cases, just the adoption was you know, progressing gradually along. And then kind of COVID came and completely accelerated that. Uh, the other reason is that we've had a long enough sample period now in, in this pseudo post pandemic life that we're not really seeing a reversion back to what consumer behavior was like before. Myself personally, I haven't stepped inside of a grocery store uh, since the pandemic began. I don't plan on doing it again. So mm -hmm. there is kind of this just permanent change in the way that pay that people pay and, and shop and so forth uh, that I don't think it's going to go away. Um, and so in the same way, we're, we're seeing that change in focus from frosters as well. Now there's kind of focusing very much on these new digital channels, on these new digital payment use cases. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to be quite as focused on uh, stealing payment information from in-store terminals at a large hardware store. They're gonna be thinking about how they could potentially exploit security gaps for a small or medium-sized business that it has to go digital for the first time and may not have the resources or the expertise necessary to protect themselves. Right, right. So the, the, the fraudsters are, are specifically finding the weak spots and, and exploiting them. Absolutely. Yeah, again, they're very much so uh, kind of poking and probing at kind of the seams of this digital payment transformation and figuring out where are there kind of potential vulnerabilities that haven't yet been discovered. They can exploit fairly quickly and efficiently. Um, you know, at the end of the day, their job is somewhat easier, right? They only have to find one vulnerability. They only have to be right one time. Mm -hmm. We, on the other side, we have to get it right every single time. Right. You know, I think one of the really interesting points about cybersecurity is that it's often said data is the most precious resource when it comes to fighting fraud. Explain mm -hmm. to us, why is that true? Uh, so very much so true. I agree with the spirit of that statement. I will just modify it a little bit to say that it's it's really the, the insights are uh -huh. the most right. powerful tool of, of fighting fraud. And uh, raw, raw data space. alone is not going to help us. We need insights. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, Visa has petabytes and petabytes of data. Uh, but if we were analyzing that data through Microsoft Excel, we would get very minimal value out of that. 
right? Because it just, it would not be efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one of the big reasons why over the past five years, we've invested about $500 million in our AI, ML, and data platform capabilities because we want to take these massive volumes of data and be able to process it in an efficient way so that we can glean insights that allow us to react to these emerging fraud schemes as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to kind of go to the point, I think the, the value of this massive data processing infrastructure that we have in place is twofold. One, it allows us to automate on a large scale, right? So Visa processes literally billions of transactions across trillions of dollars uh, a year. And we're constantly looking for that needle in the haystack. We can't do it on a manual basis. We have to be able to kind of scale that capacity really quickly. Sure. Um, and so there's that automation piece. And the second benefit, it's around the exponential ability to find connections that wouldn't be readily apparent to an individual fraud analyst. Uh, and so that's where that AI, AI, AI ML capability comes into place so that we can identify that needle in the haystack as quickly as possible and put a stop to it before uh, it results in any large losses for us or our clients. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've talked about some of the ways that Visa is using AI and ML. I mean, let, let's drill down into that. I mean, what innovations has Visa introduced to secure the movement of money? Yeah, and so uh, you know, we've AI ML as a topic has gotten a lot of traction uh, lately, but we've actually been using that you know since the '90s. You know, we we're kind of one of the first pioneers of the space before it was even called AI ML. Mm -hmm. And so uh, every visa transaction that comes across our network gets uh, analyzed based on 500 different data labels that get attached to it so that we can assess the riskiness of that transaction. And then we're able to uh, help our clients action that insight by declining bad transactions, approving good transactions. And that, uh, and all that happens globally in milliseconds. So every time you tap your card or every time you click purchase, by the time you get that payment confirmation, we've already done that analysis on those 500 data elements and we've returned that result. Which Can I ask you a question about that? Just, yeah, just, yeah. just to clarify that, because that sure. figure seems so amazing. So every single transaction yeah. has 500 data elements attached to it. Actually, no, every, uh, the data transactions that we have, have uh, more than 500 data elements, but we use 500 data elements that are most relevant to assessing the riskiness of the visa data transaction, which I know it's even actually more mind boggling when you think about the amount of data that gets transferred uh, <laughs> to make those payments happen. St storing that data and moving that data has got to be a gargantuan task. Oh, absolutely. Again, it's uh, part of the massive investments that we have uh, made over the past few years. So I've talked about the 500 million in our AI uh, ML data platforms, about 9 billion uh, overall over that same period uh, in terms of securing our data, building up our cyber fusion centers and allowing us to handle, process, store and securely transmit uh, all of that information so we can keep uh, uh, the, the ecosystem moving forward. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So let's, well, I just want one other thing about the AI ML piece and that I hear yeah, a lot yeah. of people in the industry say that they certainly want to rely on artificial intelligence and machine learning, but yeah. those technologies are in many ways more closer to their infancy than, than full maturity. Uh, agree, disagree with that? I think it's certainly a, a life cycle. And also it's very much, you know, AI ML is such a, a huge right. uh, field. There are so many different subdivisions within all of it. Uh, it very much kind of depends on what you're looking for. I would say the kind of the rate of progress and the innovation that has happened in the space is certainly has accelerated over the, um, kind of the past few years. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely very exciting to us in terms of what that next generation of the technology would look like when we go into kind of deep learning models and neural networks, which are a lot more kind of unstructured. We're not just looking at uh, kind of patterns in the data, but being a little bit more predictive in terms of what's going to come next. Uh, somewhat minority report ask, but you know, doing it for good. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, yes, there's absolutely a massive runway ahead of us when it comes to AI ML, but we are already realizing the benefits of it today, you know, mm -hmm. kind of moving beyond that traditional uh, trade-off that we've had where we can have a very secure transaction 
but it's going to be incredibly friction filled for the customer. Or we can have a very seamless transaction, but it's going to be very um, susceptible to fraud. You know, using AI ML, some of these capabilities kind of removes that trade off. You can have both. It's fantastic. Interesting. Well, uh, let's look to the future of, of cybersecurity and digital payment. Uh, it's yeah. going to be a big sector. Uh, obviously, a lot of money going into that sector. What, what are some key milestones you would expect in the years ahead? Yeah. So, you know, I think for me, we're talking about all these innovations that we're making. And again, one of the key points I, I like to reiterate is that, you know, the good guys don't have a monopoly on innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. The bad guys on the other side are using kind of these same techniques and right. uh, deploying them for their own illicit purposes. Uh, and AI ML is uh, no different. So for instance, we're all familiar with kind of the traditional email scam that gets sent your way and it's you know, typo filled, it's completely obvious, but right. you know, one out of a hundred people will click on it because they're, you know, they don't know any better. Right. Well, Kind of, you could also use AI ML to go through kind of the uh, searchable web and pick out a relevant piece of data about James and craft an email that's very relevant to you. It's like, hey, you're the host of eWeek. I would love to have you come and uh, speak to us. Here's a link for you to register. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't be able to tell that uh, that's a fraudulent email. Not only that, it was actually written by a human being. It was a froster that was using this natural language processing right. software uh, combined with uh, the ability to, to search for your background information on the web to create something that's incredibly tailored and that actually can scale, right? That's the other benefit that AI ML brings. And so they can create these well-crafted, highly personalized emails, send them to hundreds of thousands of people and so now instead of the click rate being 1%, it goes up to 15%, 20%, 25%. Yeah. And so the ability to launch these highly effective, scalable fraud attacks uh, becomes much more realizable. And so that's you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night. It's like, oh, it's fantastic. We're innovating. We're making things better. Mm -hmm. But there's the kind of the flip side of that coin. So how do we kind of continue to stay one step ahead mm -hmm. uh, and, and kind of make sure that we're uh, kind of putting ourselves in the shoes of these threat actors and, and figuring out how some of these technologies can be used um, illicitly and counter that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You know, the way you described it, it, it's it's something I've often thought is that sometimes I think that the bad guys have more resources than the good guys to a certain mm -hmm. extent and that depending on what the scenario, but there are there's organized crime is maybe perhaps there's a nation state that's that's involved mm -hmm. with with Froster. So, there's yeah. no lack of resources on the other side. And, and on, on the side of the good guys, you mentioned the small business, sometimes they're, they're really underfunded, which is a big part yeah. of the problem. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so that's actually been one of the key trends that we had seen as uh, uh, you know, the world became a lot more digital. And as I was mentioning, these small businesses had to open up digital storefronts for the first time in order for them to survive. Well, Frosters picked up on that, and what we noticed in our data is that small businesses started to be a target for malware that gets injected in their checkout websites oh. that is skimming payment information as customers are completing their online orders. So you click submit, uh, the order goes through, but then that payment data gets sent to a malicious command and control center, and then it gets sold on the dark web, or it's used to make fraudulent transactions um, that, that get monetized accordingly. So what we have done on our side is kind of seeing that gap. We've built our own capability uh, that essentially scans these websites and looks for different malware signatures. And when it identifies them, we work with the hosting provider to bring those down or mediate the websites before that sensitive data is exfiltrated elsewhere. Hmm. That's great. Uh, Michael, I think you said it. It's a lot of good stuff. It's going to be a, an interesting sector to follow in the years ahead. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your insight today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.